Okay. Uh, my name is Rick Davies. I'm an evaluation consultant based in Cambridge in the United Kingdom. And my presentation today, as you know, is going to be about predictive modeling as an evaluation tool. And I like sprinkling a few quotations around uh, in my presentations. And this first one I particularly like uh, because it is so often the case that when you're working on something and you're trying to solve a problem, if you look a bit further afield, you'll discover someone else has done that. And in a sense, what this presentation is all about is me as an evaluator looking a bit further afield and discovering that somebody else has already solved how to do something that I was struggling with. I'll come into the details of that shortly. So this is the agenda. I think we've got two hours, if I'm correct. And I was struggling to think how to make this exercise a participatory workshop in a plenary setting. And I don't think I've quite got the answer to that. Uh, so basically what I'm going to try and do is do three separate presentations where you have a right to intervene and ask questions as I go along. But hopefully we've got enough time for both presentation and discussion and then move on to presentation and discussion uh, in three iterations. But do feel free to uh, ask questions as we go along. Um, if that's getting a little bit out of control and we're going to sort of not cover the whole territory, well, I'm going to have to make a judgment call about whether we really do need to cover the whole territory or whether we need to speed up. So this is the program that I've got in mind. In the first session, I'm going to be basically providing a sort of background perspective, my particular background perspective coming from the perspective of an evaluator. And then in the second session, I'm going to be talking about one particular uh, bit of software called EvalC3, which is an Excel application which you can use to do predictive modeling for evaluation purposes. And then in the last session, I'm going to be walking through some examples, which uh, I have an example analysis, which I've done myself and which might be of interest to you, which I hope will be of interest to you. So that's the program for today. Uh, any questions at this point? Okay, so I'm going to start off with um, a sort of uh, context setting about what machine learning is all about. Machine learning is a subset of artificial intelligence and I've looked around for various definitions of artificial intelligence and machine learning and if you do a Google search you'll find countless diagrams showing how they, are, how they can be classified. But one of the definitions I like is artificial intelligence is what we'd like to have and machine learning is what we've actually got. So um, Today I'm going to be talking about one aspect of machine learning and if you follow this chart on the right hand side I'm going to be talking primarily about the discovery side of machine learning approaches and in particular about the predictive side and more particularly about classification uh, pred type predictions rather than regression predictions and I'll hopefully clarify that a bit as we go along. But broadly speaking I'm defining machine learning um, as algorithms applied to data aided by a computer's speed and memory. And we should not underestimate those very mundane attributes of computers which can make a huge difference to putting uh, algorithms to work because algorithms typically involve a lot of iteration. So uh, machine learning algorithms uh, are used for many purposes but three general purposes are to find clusters of things, types of things that seem to form natural groupings. Uh, predictors of individual things, so we might have association rules or prediction rules, and we'll look at plenty of these as we go along. And exceptions to most things, positive or negative outliers. So some examples here of uh, classification type prediction would be um, what attributes of a project proposal might best predict whether the project will subsequently achieve its objectives. Whereas a regression, which is another form of prediction, but um, uh, working with numerical data, would be phrased more along the lines of how well do project proposal um, appraisal scores predict the degree to which projects achieve their objectives. And on the clustering side, uh, on the description side, if we looked at clustering, we might be asked what type of cooperatives uh, have we supported? I'm doing some work at the moment with Oxfam doing an analysis of a data set on, um, on cooperatives that they've been supporting. And uh, what type of comments have people made about our service on Twitter or other social media? 
and exceptions uh, might be along the lines of, are there any households in this poor community where children are well nourished? Oxfam are particularly interested in positive deviance type uh, cooperatives where a cooperative has done well despite all the circ circumstances surrounding it suggesting that it shouldn't do well. So I now want to just talk uh, briefly about predictive versus explanatory models. Uh, and I've, this is a very sort of simple scheme, schemata here, suggesting that explanatory models uh, and predictive models have different constituencies, but there are some constituencies in the middle who have an interest in the both. So if you look at most historians, uh, they're interested in explaining what, uh, describing and explaining what took place in the past, but very few historians, at least these days, are seriously interested in trying to predict the future. On the other half, hand, if you're uh, an investor in the stock market, uh, particularly if you're a stock market trader, uh, your main interest is finding a good prediction rule that will enable you to make a, a net profit over, over the course of the trading year. You won't necessarily be all that worried about whether the prediction rule has any causal process underneath it, but just so long as it works 55% of the time, you'll be doing quite well. And then in the middle, I think there are a significant number of people and I rather hesitatingly suggested that surgeons might be one of these, who are interested in not only predictive models, but explanatory models. So they want to know that if they carry out this bit of surgery, that the, there's a 99% chance that the person will survive, but they also want a good understanding of the causal mechanisms involved in case if they have to do any uh, change the way they approach the surgery, uh, they, they know because of their causal model they won't be causing unforeseen co circumstances. And I'd like to think that uh, when it comes to looking at evaluation and evaluators, that we are or should be in this middle ground, looking for both explanatory models and predictive models. We want to explain what took, past in the, took part in the past, but we want that knowledge to have some utility in terms of going forward as to what should happen next or, and how people could use the data and the analysis that we and others have done. So, what I'm interested particularly in trying to cover that middle ground territory is to try and find predictive modeling approaches which are consistent with a particular approach to causality. And there are many different views on causality, but the one that interested me most and which got me on this journey uh, in, in which I'm describing uh, is a view that comes from qualitative comparative analysis, QCA. Could I have a quick show of hands? Is anyone here familiar with QCA? Okay, two, three, four people. Okay, right. So um, this is a, field, a type of analysis coming from political science in the 1980s and is now fairly widely used amongst some evaluators uh, in Europe and America. And I'll just explain the core ideas uh, about causality that I uh, were trying to find would fit with a predictive modeling approach. The first is the notion of uh, conjunctural causation that the world is not filled with lots of single individual causes but with packages of causes that work together and if they're not together they, don't, they aren't effective. And the second notion is of multiple conjunctural causation that not only are there various packages of causes around but often an outcome like people turning up in this event here today can arise from multiple conjunctural causes, multiple packages of causes. So you might be, one person might be coming here because their boss told them to come here uh, and it wasn't very far to come so they thought, okay, I'll come. Another person said, I, you know, I'm coming here because this is spot on the sort of subject I'm interested in, I'm doing doctoral research and this will help me. So there could be multiple packages of causes. Um, this idea is covered by another term called equifinality. There's more than one route to an end outcome. The other idea is asymmetric causality, that someone might not have come here today, not because they weren't interested and didn't have a PhD to complete or their boss wasn't telling them to come here, but because they did want to come here, they were interested, but their child needed uh, urgent medical attention and they had to go and address that. So that's an asymmetric cause. It's not just about the absence of a cause, but about some other intervening factor altogether. And then there are some other interesting uh, causal um, uh, perspectives which interest me, the idea of an exclusive or cause. So some of you who are familiar with savings and credit programs might know that in the past it was highly unadvisable to combine both a grant element and a loan element if you were trying to help small enterprises because it was thought that would, uh, the recipient would confuse the intention about whether a, a loan needed to re, be repaid. 
And so it was advised that you either give a grant or you give a loan, and both can be effective, but don't give them both at the same time. Then the other distinction which I wanted to be, uh, the approach to be consistent with is a difference between effects of a cause and causes of an effect. So quite often, um, we're, like a randomized controlled trial, they're interested in causes of an effect, trying to isolate what was the cause of a particular effect. But with participatory evaluations, often you're looking at, uh, you're, you're discovering and uncovering lots of different effects. And what you might be interested in is the association between which of those are effects are associated with a particular intervention. So they're two different perspectives. And hopefully we can find ways of uh, exploring both of those rather than just one. So hands up how many of you have already thought, yes, but correlation doesn't equal causation. Right, okay, good, honest. Okay, so this is a particular bugbear of mine. Um, I feel we need to almost send this cliche on a holiday uh, because it's basically always a bit like a naysaying uh, statement. It doesn't sort of seem to take you anywhere. It just says, don't go there. You're, not, you're on the wrong way. So I'm suggesting we replace it by two different perspectives which inform the way that we'll go ahead in this presentation. And firstly, the state, an alternative statement is an absence of an association does mean an absence of a causation. And that's a very useful thing to know that if these things are not cor uh, correlated or associated, then there can be no causal process. That helps us wipe out large areas of inquiry that we don't have to g use more intensive research methods to investigate. So that's a very useful, knowing, knowing what is not worth pursuing is a very useful bit of knowledge. And the second phrase I'd like to uh, see used is association is a necessary but insufficient basis for a causal claim. So it's the first step on the way to making a causal claim, but it's by no means guaranteed. So once we find an association, then we should start looking for other evidence of causal processes that are at work, and that, that begs the question of how do we uncover those, uh, those causal processes at work, which I'll touch upon. So it enables us to narrow down the search focus from what I call cro what's called cross-case analysis to more in-depth investigation, which might happen through a within-case analysis. And QCA is one method of analysis which I think is very good in this respect of moving from cross-case analysis to then looking at individual cases, which then sheds light on problems in the cross-case analysis. So there's often an iteration going backwards and forwards between those levels of analysis. So here are some possible areas of application of looking for associations in terms of the way I've just described. And you'll note, I, I take a fairly broad view of evaluation. Evaluation is about evaluative thinking, and that can happen at all stages of a program or, or, or project or policy development process. So here are some of the possible associations that we could be looking for, and I'll be talking about some of these later. At a project selection uh, stage, if we're a funding body, we might be looking at project proposals and be interested in the relationship between the content of those proposals and their subsequent performance. Oh, sorry, and, their, and the subsequent decisions about whether to fund them or not, because there might be a decision-making process involving a committee who's, uh, who go through long discussions, but actually working out what it was that was key to a decision to fund or not may not be immediately apparent and some way of eliciting the, the key associations that were associated with a decision to fund might be quite helpful in terms of being publicly transparent about how you make these decisions. The second, uh, which I've talked about already, is associations between uh, the content of a project proposal and its subsequent success as a project or not. Then during project implementation, there are many opportunities for looking for meaningful associations between what's going on, and I've just given two examples here. Um, the first is the, we might look at participants' experiences of a workshop or training event like this and their subsequent judgments, global judgments, about just how useful those events were. Uh, there's a, a distinction between facet aspect, facets and global judgments. So facet judgments are about particular things, like how good the food was at lunchtime, and global judgments are about um, as, as a, looking back at the event as a whole, would you recommend it to friends of yours to do that same training? 
Similarly, donors and grantees' um, experiences of their working relationships with each other uh, and their judgments about the success of those working relationships, this is another area where finding associations between particular facets of those relationships and overall judgments of success or productivity might be of interest. Then during project evaluations, which uh, perhaps may be more central to many people's interest, uh, these, po these three possible uses, which I, I've, I've touched upon already, which is looking for, um, sorry, there's a, there should be causes of an effect, and effects of a, uh, a cause. So we might be doing either of those types of analyses, or we might be looking for positive deviates, or we might be looking for one or more of those. Then, finally, and this has a particular interest for me because I've been probably doing more work in this area, is during a review of existing evaluations. Uh, some evaluations will publish their data sets, particularly those using QCA because they're usually not very big data sets. In those cases, you can look at the data that was used by an evaluation and reanalyze it to verify the findings that were documented. Similarly, uh, you can look at data that's been collected in attempts to synthesize evaluations, and I'll be giving an example later on of an attempt by Oxfam to synthesize a number of their evaluations where I was able to reanalyze that data. Um, getting fortunately close to the end of this segment, um, I've just put up a list here of three software packages. A lot of data mining is done by specialists who are able to use Python or R or various coding languages to customize their, uh, the processes. But for ordinary mortals, we are probably looking for uh, software packages that have all the coding is behind uh, the screen and we're using something a bit more user friendly. And I've got three recommendations here, one of which is I'm slightly biased towards, but the other two and less so. The first is Rapid Miner Studio, which uh, is available online, but you can download it to your desktop. And basically, you can carry out all sorts of data mining analyses using modules, a little bit like bricks that you connect up to each other. And when you connect them the wrong way, it tells you you've done it the wrong way. And um, you can use these to take data from a file, pr pre-process it, analyze it, and then evaluate the model. I've used this, I started using, it's probably the first package I started using. Then there's Big ML, which is totally online. Um, I should say Rapid Miner, Rapid Miner Studio has a free version. Big ML is, has a free version, and that's online, and you can do simple and sophisticated uh, data mining analyses using that. And then the last one is of LC3, which is the Excel app, which I'll be talking about in the next segment, and that's... Um, an app which I developed uh, about two years ago, and that is also free, but the main difference there is it's not only uh, desktop-based, but it's, it's usable within Excel, which I think 99% of all people doing evaluation will have a fairly good familiarity with. And that was one of the main reasons why I put it in Excel, although at the moment we're seeking funding to actually have a web-based version of it. So the key points that I just want to make from this segment uh, there are simple and useful forms of machine learning and predictive models can help systematically and transparently narrow the scope of our inquiries uh, that will lead us to find some useful explanations. And predictive modeling can be useful at all stages of a planning cycle. And there are many predictive modeling packages. I've only showed you three. Uh, and, and some of these are quite user-friendly and don't require any coding knowledge. And I, the last point is that the EVLC3 app that I'm talking about is, as far as I know, the only one aimed at evaluators as users of it who will be uh, searching for predictive and uh, explanatory models and who will be both wanting to do a form of hypothesis-led inquiry and data-led inquiry. I think I'll stop at that point and just throw the floor open for questions.